Hello, Keith Kaiser here again with another lesson from God's Word. We're working our way through Luke's life of Christ, in other words, the gospel according to Luke. Today we come to a new chapter, but the thought flow carries on from what's gone before. We're in chapter 21, Luke 21 and verse 1. And speaking of the Lord Jesus, it says, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Now there's some similarities between this little incident the Lord describes and what he has just spoken of at the end of chapter 20. In verse 45, he is telling in the hearing of the people. In verse 46, he says, beware of the scribes. So he's warning them about false religion and how humans love to put up a religious facade that very many people cultivate a religious reputation and particularly these scribes of the Lord Jesus day were a good example that what they did was not Godward. It wasn't theologically focused. It was manward. It was for what others think of them. They were possessed by the fear of man and they enjoyed the perquisites and the different benefits that came to them from their religious position. So they like to go around in the long robes, the distinctive garbs of the religious scribe, of the expert in religion, of the educated, theologically speaking. They love the greetings in the marketplaces. They love the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They enjoyed all of that. But what about the positive duties that uh, true religion would enjoin? What about if we're having a relationship with the living God and we're living in a way that pleases him? We wouldn't do the next thing that the Lord says the scribes were doing. He says they devour widows' houses. So they were using their religious efforts to despoil the people, to take from the people. And true Christianity is about giving. True religion is about bringing people into the glorious freedom of knowing Christ. If we're bringing people into bondage to human legalism, to man-made laws and traditions that make life onerous and that exploit people economically and take money from them and make their lives difficult while we live high off the hog, so to speak, it shows that we are spiritually fraudulent, that we are counterfeit servants of God. Because true religion, or what first, uh, sorry, what James chapter 1, verse 27, I believe, says, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, that one may visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from the world. And this is the exact opposite of what the scribes were doing. They were not visiting the orphans and the widows to help them in their extremity. They were exploiting widows, devouring their houses. That's a powerful descriptor of the terrible devastation that their false spiritual activity and false teaching brought upon this people. And yet the world over, you can see people living in misery, not only economic misery, but spiritual misery, because there are people over them that oppress. And many times we think about political oppression, that's a terrible thing, but still uh, at least as bad, if not worse, is spiritual oppression. Groups that exploit people and keep them down and use them for the leader's benefit. And that's exactly what these scribes were doing. Well, it wasn't what the Lord Jesus was doing. He had a care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger, for the disenfranchised and the vulnerable, for the person who was an alien without rights in the society. The Lord had a great care for them. And here we had another group of people that were doing what they were doing, apparently, uh, with many of them at least, with great care for appearance. The rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And it seems like uh, comparing different scriptures where the Lord talks about this, that they were doing that very ostentatiously. Look at what a great philanthropist I am. Look at how generous I am towards other people. Now, in our own day, we can see this kind of thing. That there are <coughs> many very wealthy people, tycoons, that give generously to certain causes and to certain things. And not all of that is bad. I mean, we're grateful when the common grace in humanity is seen. In other words, 
God writes inside of us, hardwires us with moral standards. We know good and evil. And not everyone, uh, people are not as bad as they could possibly be, nor are they as good as they ought to be. You know, apart from God, we show... <clears throat> pardon me, we show that we have an understanding of good and evil and what the right thing is to do. And there can be a natural compassion in people's hearts that they desire to have mercy on those who are less fortunate and to show alms. And the current generation in Western countries uh, certainly speaks a lot on this order. They're, they're interested, well-meaning and intentioned, in solving a lot of the problems around the world, in helping with disease and combat poverty and illiteracy and different problems of lack of education. And certainly believers in the Lord Jesus Christ don't deplore these things. In fact, historically, the church has been in the vanguard of education, of caring for the poor, of helping the sick and the indigent. One has only to look through history at the founding and developing of hospitals and of uh, leper colonies and of prison ministries and of different efforts for the poor and for the homeless, different rescue missions all around the world that have been established to help people. So Christians have been interested in this sort of thing right from the very beginning. And we see it in the book of Acts at the beginning of church history that they were very concerned with giving to those who were poor. And Paul would say about his meeting with Peter and the other apostles in Galatians 2, they were only concerned that we remember the poor, the same thing I was also forward to do. In other words, that was something the 12 apostles who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ, they were concerned with helping the poor. And so was Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, concerned with helping the poor. And yet their priority was always to deal with the spiritual poverty to the utmost. In other words, yes, help the poor, yes, help the sick, yes, help the weak and vulnerable. But if we fail to give them the true gospel while we're doing that, then we've missed our mission because our calling is to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, the Lord Jesus told his followers in Matthew 28. And Matthew 16 puts it even a bit more broadly, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So as the early church went out to the poor and the indigent and the helpless and the vulnerable, they were always concerned with preaching. They were always concerned with telling them about the Lord. I'm giving you food, but that's not the end of it, full stop. I'm doing it in the name of Christ. I'm healing you. But not just so that you're physically bettered, but your soul left in the same lost condition. I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church's philanthropy, our generosity, always has to be connected with our testimony to the risen Christ. The one who died on the cross for our sins and rose again for our justification. That is our message and that needs to be tied to everything we do. Now there are philanthropists in the world, very wealthy people. One of the men who is among the top five wealthiest people in the world some years ago announced that he was giving away the bulk of his fortune to charity, to help people with difficulty. And he said, he made this statement, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was to this, this line of things. He said, there are many ways of getting to heaven, but I suppose this is a good one. And of course, there was nothing true about that statement. There aren't many ways of getting to heaven. The Bible says there's one way. It's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name given among men, given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved, says Acts 4.12. And the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He said, no man knows the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son reveals him. So you have to come to Christ to be saved. Now, the wonderfully inclusive part of this is that salvation is exclusively in Christ. It's only to be found in him. But Christ came to die for the world. He offers himself to the world. The Christian church is told to go out to the whole world. So whoever you are, male or female, bond or free, rich or poor, uh, whatever color, whatever ethnicity, whatever socioeconomic background, whatever educational level, whatever else may be different about you, 
Here's the thing. As human beings, we are all sinners, and yet the salvation message in the Lord Jesus Christ is offered to us each. That the Lord Jesus says, yes, you must come to me to be saved. But he says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So the Lord offers himself without qualification to everyone, to anyone who will repent of their sin, turn to God and cry out to him for salvation. They who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call out to the Lord Jesus to save you, he will, because he died on the cross for your sins and rose again that he might give you new life. And if you cry out to him, he'll hear you and save you wherever you are. Now, it is not possible, therefore, that through our almsgiving and through charity and through giving things, we can merit salvation because there's no way to deserve salvation. There's no way to earn it by what we do. It's not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2 says. So when the Lord saw these rich putting their gifts into the treasury, he doesn't say, oh, this is a wonderful thing. Look at the rich giving so many things to the treasury. Look at them supporting the work of the temple. Now, he singles out a certain poor widow. Now, the previous section talked about how the widows were being exploited, how their households were being devoured. And it's an awful thing when we see false religion devouring the homes of the poor and the vulnerable, of them taking advantage of widows and exploiting them. But the Lord says, look at this widow. She's not being exploited. She's not being robbed of her substance uh, by misguided false teachers or by charlatans and hypocrites. She, of her own volition, she wants to give to God. She's so grateful to God that she puts in two mites. Now, it's interesting. When the Lord wants to talk about giving, he doesn't point to the rich. If he did, you know, we might say, well, I don't have enough to give. I, I, I don't have a fortune to call upon. I can't tap my uh, numbered Swiss bank accounts or my offshore accounts in the Caymans or the Bahamas and, you know, give out of that, out of this tremendous store that I have. No, he points to someone who's absolutely impoverished, someone who, and we'd say, doesn't have two nickels to rub together, except she does have two mites. And it's intriguing, as many have pointed out, if she only had one mite, well, we'd say she has the choice of either giving or not giving. I mean, if she gives one mite, she's given all that she has, but she has two mites. She might give one and still keep one for herself. But here she puts in two mites. And the Lord says, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all for all these out of their abundance have put in the offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Now, the Lord commends her because here's a woman who had a choice and yet she gave all that she had. And the Lord, of course, was going to take care of her because he speaks in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount about looking to our Father who knows we have needs. He knows the clothes we need. He knows the food that we need to eat. He knows the things that we need concerning material existence, concerning the body. The Lord knows that and he provides he promises to provide those things. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So he singles out this impoverished woman, says out of the poverty, she's given all the livelihood that she had. This is the standard of Christian generosity. This is what God moves a person to do who realizes the riches that they've received in Christ, who realizes as 2 Corinthians 8 9 puts it, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And so the Lord who owned, as Psalm 50 says, all the cattle on a thousand hills and owns everything on the planet, who he could say the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24 1. Yet the Lord gave all that he had. He left his heavenly glory. He left all of the wealth and privilege he had, and he died as someone who was utterly bankrupt for us, someone whose clothes were gambled for by his enemies, someone who was hung up as an object of shame on the cross. And even more, he went lower still. He poured himself out completely 
as a sacrifice for sin. Isaiah 53 talks about him making his soul an offering for sin. So the Lord gave everything that he had. That's the standard of generosity. And this woman, out of gratitude to God, knowing that everything she had came from God, she gives back everything to the Lord. Well, one of our old hymns says, Not what I have count I my own, I hold it for the giver. In other words, whatever I have, I realize it's come from a giver. It's come from God. I'm a steward of it. I'm to take care of it for God. I'm to prayerfully consider how to use it for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. And I'm to be used in God's hand, to be open-handed as God is, to be generous, to be giving toward others. And not to look at the bottom line of the exact monetary value of the gift, because some of us can't give great gifts in the thousands or in the millions of dollars, but we can give all that we have. We should give ourselves first to the Lord and then give of what he's given to us. Well, the Lord knew what this widow had done, so it wasn't by appearance, it was by heart. He looked through the crowds and he discerned this woman who no doubt was incognito and completely obscure to all those around. They had no idea what, who she was or what she was doing, but the Lord knew. And it's a wonderful thing to see how God can take simple people that give unto the Lord and he can magnify the gifts they give. They think about George Mueller, who during the course of his life, they figured out that he gave the equivalent of millions of dollars away that passed through his hands to support the work of the orphan homes in Bristol, to support missions around the world, which he gave generously to, and to help the poor and those in various difficulties on various continents. And yet when he died, his estate was only valued at the equivalent of a few hundred dollars. He left behind a bed, a desk, a chair, a Bible, a few books, a couple of changes of clothes, and that was about it. Mr. George Mueller lived a full life of being generous toward God. And so may we also, such is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.